Travelling to Burma and you travel back in time. This lush green country is a living museum of ancient Asia and turn of the century British colonialism. Surrounded by Thailand, Laos, Bangladesh, China, Tibet and India, it was only six years ago that Burma awoke from three decades of isolation. Hidden behind a curtain of military rule, many parts of the country remain unchanged from centuries ago. But that is about to change. Burma has stepped onto the world stage and into the centre of an international argument. The only way to protect our shared interests is to encourage a genuine political dialogue between the government and the chosen representatives of the Burmese people. At the centre of this controversy are human rights, business rights and this woman. Aung San Suu Kyi, leader of the National League for Democracy, has placed herself at odds with Asia's businessmen and Burma's ruling military junta. The party won general elections in 1990, but the military refused to give up power. Sanctions and isolation, she tells the world, will take away that power. But at what cost to the people? Their future rests with the international debate, to engage or to isolate. Ironically, Burma was once Asia's richest country. As well as its mineral wealth, it produced and sold more rice than any nation in the world. But shortly after the end of the Second World War, its decline began. National hero General Aung San, destined to become one of the great figures of post-colonial Asia, was assassinated six months before independence from the British. Thirty-nine years later, the country remembers. Martyrs' Day is a national holiday. But on this day of reflection, security is high. For six years, the daughter of Aung San was forced to remember this day in solemn detention. Today, her supporters gather to remember with her. I think what I've probably uh, inherited is his determination to carry through what we've started. Burma's door to the outside world was shut in 1962 following a bloodless coup that brought isolationist President Nay Win to power. The State Law and Order Restoration Council, more commonly referred to by the somewhat Orwellian title of Slork, then changed the country's name to Myanmar and the capital to Yangon and began courting foreign investors. The legal system is the English-based legal system, so it's much easier for foreign investors. Uh, you get countries like uh, Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, which have had to start promulgating laws from a very, very low base. In recent years, we have, we have found out that both in Vietnam and Burma, the standard of living is so much lower than that of China. Uh, a lot of us went there to start up basically manufacturing facilities and uh, things, places like Burma where we could get workers to work for us for like around $20 US a month because of their standard of living being so low. Uh, it's very attractive to local uh, investors. Hong Kong businessman Joe Peng realised the country's potential early in 1985. His garment company was the first joint venture manufacturer in Burma. I wanted 500 and I got 3,000 of them standing there in heavy rain waiting for a job. Okay. And when we pick up the 500 we want to hire, I look at a whole group of them standing out there feeling so miserable. 
I couldn't help but turn around and told my factory manager, I say, let's stick in two more hundred, train them. To help Wu foreigners, Slork offers a number of financial incentives. Among them, exemptions from income taxes for up to three years, repatriation of profits and invested capital, and guarantees against nationalisation. In the six years to January, outside investment totaled three billion US dollars from 165 enterprises and 18 countries. The UK was the biggest spender, followed by Singapore. Investors are concerned. They want political stability as well as economic stability. Um, but a lot of investors are going in because they do see if they don't grab the brass ring right now, they're not going to. Uh, they're not going to be there. Since 1990, Burma's economy has slowly improved, but corruption is now rife, poverty is rising and inflation rampant. A senior diplomat in Rangoon says the conditions that are leading to phenomenal economic growth in other Asian tiger economies by and large do not exist here. He says there are serious international concerns over government spending. Economists will tell you that a country's investment in its population's health and education will lead directly to increases in its long-term economic growth. But in Burma, government spending on health and education is falling dramatically. For every child that begins school here, 60% drop out by the fifth grade. More than half the population is unemployed and drugs abuse and AIDS are reaching epidemic proportions. Yet at the same time, the ruling regime is devoting 40% of the country's income to to military budgets. It's a recipe, economists say, that will lead to economic disaster. A very, very small group of the population, let's say about 2%, which is the number of military here, they are becoming wealthier and wealthier. They can buy the cars, they can buy the things they want. They live in million dollar homes. But the people in the street, the average people in the street, they don't have any money to spend. Han Markalina's company imports pharmaceuticals, food and consumer products. He has just completed a report recommending the company withdraw from Burma. He agreed to be interviewed on condition his company not be identified. Constructive engagement here doesn't work. The port is clogged up completely. There's a nine week backlog in Singapore for container vessels. There are about 60 boats waiting in line to offload cargo, general cargo. It takes up, up to two months just for waiting time before you get something over here. As Western countries move out, their Asian counterparts are ready and willing to move in. Among them, Hong Kong and Macau businessmen. There are now 34 Hong Kong and Macau companies doing business in Burma, and that figure is rising. The reason? Asian businessmen don't have pressure groups bullying them into sanctions. Most investors will look at uh, the country that their headquarter is. If it's a Hong Kong company, we will look upon our government whether our government accepts Burma as a trading partner. Uh, if I'm from America, I will look at whether the US government have trade sanctions against Burma. If not, then certainly we will invest there. So ethics in terms of human rights is maybe something that the company wouldn't look at? I don't think so. Downtown Rangoon has been transformed in the past few years from a sombre grid of empty streets into a bustling city. But the poor are being moved out into satellite townships where AIDS and the abuse of drugs are on the rise. Burma is the world's largest producer of opium and it supplies the United States with 70% of its heroin. There's only one doctor for every 12,000 people in Burma, which isn't so surprising given the pay. The police and military supplement their meagre incomes through bribery. My taxi driver was able to avoid a substantial traffic violation by tipping the policeman 100 chat. But as he says, here in Burma, it's simply a part of everyday life. Since 1948, Burma has been home to one of the most complicated civil conflicts in the world. This conflict has given rise to over 70 military groups, 28 which are known to still bear arms. Today, ceasefire agreements with ethnic groups are tenuous. The Karens continue to frustrate government moves to bring all states under its control. 
It is these areas where Burma's human rights record is at its worst. Forced relocation and forced labour. Even they recruit, you know, uh, children, something like child soldier. Yeah. And also woman trafficking because the army is, you know, participated, involved, you know, in that move. Human Rights Watch Asia says the Thai border is littered with 90,000 refugees driven from their villages by government forces.